just a little bit about myself. My name is Raj Narendra. I'm a professor here at the Leon Hess Business School. Um, I teach strategy and global management. Okay, Rosemary, welcome. Thanks everyone. I'm glad you could be with us today. And I hope you're keeping track of my time because <clears throat> you just reminded me that we haven't really practiced our time. He'll mainly be participating in the Q&A. Okay. So um, this is not the teaching track, but this is actually a teaching um, presentation. And it's about a course that I created and Yusuf has been teaching for three semesters at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So just to give you some background, um, ours is part of the City University of New York. It's uh, a college that is focused on criminal justice related uh, education. We have about 15,000 students and there are particular characteristics and this is relevant to um, the course that we have taught on the SDGs. So 50% are first generation, 75% are from the New York City Public Schools. Uh, the undergrads are 50% Hispanic, and uh, but we do have um, 130 countries represented, and we have a federal designation of being a minority serving institution as well as a Hispanic serving institution. So in addition to that, um, <clears throat> Uh, about 60% of our undergraduates are on Pell Grants and our six year graduation rate is 54%. So we are talking about a student body um, generally uh, that is socially and financially disadvantaged um, and that uh, is generally coming to college for the first time and aiming to um, pivot to the middle class as uh, a result of their college studies. Um, an unusual aspect of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which you might think is very uh, domestically oriented, given that it's focused on criminal justice, is that it is the only place in the United States where you can study a major called international criminal justice. Uh, we have celebrated already our 20th anniversary as this major was founded in 2001. And this is a pioneering and unique major, uh, which encompasses comparative criminal justice and criminology, the study of transnational crime, and also international law and violations of human rights. Uh, we are a member of the UN Academic Impact. Uh, many faculty collaborate with the United Nations, even though we have no college strategy on how to do so. And obviously in our mission statement, like most colleges, we have uh, a push for global citizenship. So the course that was created several years ago um, was created as a transfer seminar for sophomores. We have um, about 20% of sophomores that are transfer students. And as many of you may know, transfer students have um, a number of issues. They have advantages as well as, as disadvantages as students, but uh, there was an opportunity to create a course just for them to get them used to being at a four-year um, institution, to help them bond to faculty and classmates, and to get them sort of on board with our mission, which is educating for justice. Um, so the goals of these transfer seminars included um, inquiry, uh, methodological thinking, um, study skills, habits of mind, collaboration, and community awareness. And we created this course as part of a series of transfer seminars that students have to take when they are sophomores. And we created this one um, within the International Criminal Justice major, but in collaboration with the Human Rights minor, and we also have a sustainability minor. So the SDGs provide, um, I will argue, first of all, substance for the teaching of global citizenship. And for a criminal justice college, the most relevant one is SDG 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. Um, but there are obviously also very strong sustainability goals in terms of environmental action, 6, 7, 11, 12, uh, 13, 14, and 15, and obviously a strong human rights emphasis within the goals. Um, so the SDGs are very relevant to us as a criminal justice college, but for this particular course, they have an additional relevance, which is related to how they are implemented and monitored. So if we remember the implementation process for the SDGs, we have goals, we have targets, we have indicators, we have measurement, monitoring, 
and frequent reporting and reflection. And it is this part of the goals that we thought were particularly relevant for transfer student success, where we also want them to uh, become mindful of pursuing and finishing a college degree and setting goals and targets and indicators for themselves on their educational journey. Um, so the course is twofold in addressing both of those aspects of the SDGs and translating it into a course that is relevant, both in terms of global citizenship and criminal justice, but also in terms of helping them uh, graduate on time and plan their academic journey, given that for many of our students, uh, university education, they are the first ones in their families to pursue it. So this is the course description here. Um, where we introduce the SDGs and, in, and stress the involvement of youth in obtaining uh, these goals um, and uh, introduce the course in terms of examining the background, relating it to global citizenship, and then relating it to their individual circumstances. Because as a gen ed course, this falls into a bucket that we have called justice and the individual. The instructor uh, that I selected for uh, the course is an adjunct lecturer. It's uh, you, my co-presenter, Yusuf Al-Masri. He is um, an, alumna, an alumnus of ours. He has a master's in international crime and justice because we also have a master's program in this area. And he is an experienced UN professional, uh, currently working at UNDP, but having worked at UNICEF, UNHCR, and IOM. So to me, he was the ideal person to take this course off the ground, and he has been teaching it now for three semesters. The course itself um, obviously has readings, films, videos, lectures. Um, it features a textbook uh, that I have a chapter in um, that is really the first textbook to focused on criminal justice and the SDGs, um, and you'll see it listed here. The course um, benefits from uh, a peer success coach, which is a coach assigned to the class um, that is uh, supposed to facilitate learning on the half of the students and also provide one-on-one -on -one advising to them. So it's an additional person in the classroom that also meets with the students outside of class. And in terms of the activities, the students do uh, work on e-portfolio. Uh, they tour the United Nations virtually or in person. They conduct a campus safety audit, uh, a scavenger hunt, which I'll describe in a minute. They do reflections on UN human rights treaties. They connect uh, the world of New York to the work of the United Nations. And we also pull some modules from UNODC's uh, Education for Justice module series on transnational crime in particular. The scavenger hunt forces the students to relate the goals to campus services. So for example, um, goal five, gender equality, they're asked to figure out what, what on campus responds to goal five and we have a Women's Center for Gender Justice, right? So in that way, they are connecting the global to the local and also exploring the many services on campus for students with which as transfer students, they would be unfamiliar. Um, the main assignment in the class is a team assignment where students in plans, uh, teams of four, act as a planning committee for a UN Day of Commemoration. This was mentioned, I believe, by Monmouth University President that it, uh, there, there is no UN Day of Commemoration actually today, but there is a whole listing of them for every day of the year. And so students select one of them. Uh, have to relate how it um, uh, is connected to the SDGs, why the day of, obser of observance is important, and then they plan a fictional event. So a place on the globe where they will um, hold the event, uh, why that place is important, their target audience, a list of goals for the event, speakers that they would invite, including celebrities, other activities that they would plan as part of this day of observance, and they plan a social media campaign, and they do this on ePortfolio. And Yusuf can talk about his experience having students do this. So in terms of course successes, um, students were able to obviously understand the importance of situational analysis and connecting demographics, geography, socioeconomics, and politics. 
Um, in the team assignment, they made new friends and learned uh, team skills and the practical application of what they learned in the course. And then they understood the interconnectivities of sustainability development and communities. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, in the era where we had to move online, there was obviously, um, as with all university courses, uh, transition issues and moving the course online. And then of course, further collaboration between John Jay and the UN agencies in New York would always be beneficial for the students. So that's my presentation. Um, and um, uh, Yusuf in particular is, is uh, happy to answer questions that people may have, or maybe you have some other comments you want to add, Yusuf? Uh, no, uh, no additional comments from me. Just uh, reiterating that um, um, with um, achievements, uh, I would uh, was uh, glad to see throughout the semesters uh, that students were able to um, expand their scope from the local to the global and understand what it means. So, and I felt that with that with the course. That, uh, with that course, with, that was one of the main goals, and uh, uh, in all, even with the challenge, especially when we switched online, um, that uh, that uh, uh, goal was um, always achieved. And Yusuf, do you uh, can you comment on what days of observance the students have tended to pick? Uh, I would Fred, say Fred. that. Uh, uh, in you know, in the three uh, semesters that I uh, taught the class, students uh, uh, kind of get attracted to uh, things related to uh, uh, criminal justice. So I always had uh, a couple of projects uh, related to human trafficking. And I'll have um, always teams working on that. Um, and uh, uh, other issues related to uh, gender equality and uh, health and well-being. So these mm -hmm. are, I would say, the three main themes that uh, uh, students uh, had uh, a, a kind of a connection to and presented on. Yeah. Sure. So um, I recently presented at the UN, and one of the, the things that I walked away was that a lot of discussion and it was very nice, but how do you link um, either in the classroom use them or um, even outside, like looking at it in, mm -hmm. how are you linking the proactive action to bridge the gap once it's identified? So like, you may not- Did you hear um, it? Use how do I link- uh, uh, How do you link the talk to the walk? Is that what you're saying? Sure. <laughs> oh. <And that's>, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually uh, a lot of students when we, you know, when we like presented them with uh, the framework of the SDGs had that kind of uh, they jumped into like, okay, so what is the actual work that's been done, uh, or how it's, um, uh, uh, you know, as we mentioned, like what what. Uh, uh makes the you know what action is taking to bridge that gap and uh i always focused on uh going through uh the details of every goal and uh providing examples of uh previous uh, uh especially with you know the millennium uh, development goals which didn't reach all of their targets but showcasing the baseline at that time in the 2000s and how they are ended up in 2015 and showing that even though that uh, projects and programs not all of them were successful or i wouldn't say that successful not all of them reached their goals but the change affected significant number of people Right. For example, we didn't uh, reduce uh, uh, um, the number of people in poverty uh, to zero, but there was at least uh, 
500 to 700 million people who were uh, who benefited from moving from extreme poverty to uh, I wouldn't say middle class, but uh, out of the more the most extreme uh, levels of poverty, right? Yes, we didn't reach one billion, but you know, at least there's half a billion people who got help. And uh, putting that emphasis and conveying that idea to the students that it's it's not about yeah we have a framework we have goals, but it's uh, and we want to achieve them. But at the same time, keeping in mind uh, an, an understanding that these goals are very uh, comprehensive, global, and we don't control everything. But however, what is uh, um, crucial here is just is doing the work, doing the action, right? And uh, doing that in that framework. I think your question was more like, what can students do, right? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I would envision, um, and this is just maybe my, in my little world here, but if they're doing these fictional events, is there a chance for them to potentially do something with it that will have more of an impact with the US? So in, in an example, I'll say, in my strategy class, I'll talk theory and all the concepts, but they really get it when they apply. Right, right, into a project or a presentation. Um, so they focus on a business and then they're able to apply it. In this instance, I would say that, okay, they're studying, they're doing all this, now they're applying it to their event. Mm -hmm. What if they stumble across an amazing um, way to counter human trafficking? Mm -hmm. Is there a way for them to bridge that and present to the U.S. and have that impact? Right, right. Because, uh, well, because it's a gen ed course, we, we, we generally don't have the chance to develop that specific expertise at this level. We have an entire major mm -hmm. and a master's, and those students do present. Six master's students were at the wow. UN in Vienna last week at the Crime Commission, yeah. so we do do that. But at this level, because I'm thinking of, of other presentations here where people have said, well, we teach sustainability, and then students are taught to, to use a water bottle. So <laughs> yeah. in this class, like what could they possibly do as a practical takeaway, given that goal 16 is sort of like, well, reduce homicide, right? So, okay, please don't kill anybody. Right. But I don't know if there's any other <laughs> ways that you think, it's a good question, Yusuf, that students could actually take walk a person, walk away with something personal that they're going to do. Um, I think uh, uh, with, with that, it, it was, um, um kind of part of the uh the team project process mm -hmm. and um um my approach to that was to um as much as possible integrate the way uh, uh the un uh design uh and prepare and, and implement their projects in how they uh, work on it in a way where they, uh, the way they uh, uh, reach or uh, address the topics is that look at the topic, you no, know, and what, that's what one of the things that I saw uh, they achieve, achieved by them is uh, them being able to understand the what uh, the what are the requirements or the needs when they conduct an, an analysis of an issue. When they are looking at human trafficking, they will uh, look at, uh, you know, if um, if it's a specific region, um, what are the demographics, the uh, geographical background, the, the uh, economics of uh, uh, the issue, and once they realize these um, uh, points, then it allows them to uh, prepare the topic of. Um, what needs to be addressed, right? And the portion of the um, the project that uh, uh, focuses on the audience, like to whom they are presenting this, and I'm some of them uh, select 
you know, general uh, uh, you know, students and um, academia, some of them select policymakers. Uh, so based on that audience, they ad adapt uh, the ideas that they came up to and uh, uh, put them in a way that's presented to that specific audience. So for example, to projects that uh, uh, focuses on policymakers, they come up with, uh, you know, generally uh, three to four points uh, where uh, uh, policymakers need to, to focus on. And uh, in addition to that, they, and, and that's something that I also always emphasize when they're working on the project is uh, uh, creating um, a, a framework or an idea of evaluating uh, the event. So all the, uh, all the students will work on uh, an evaluation form that uh, uh, ask participants or the invitees to that event to um, list their understanding of the topic and then uh, the post-event evaluation uh, to show what they learned. If, for example, the project is about raising awareness, they can then, uh, uh, they can then uh, measure if there was an increase in awareness on that. And, and just that... Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> saying that it just that approach and that uh, uh, framework of thinking is, uh, from my experience, I would say, is that directly applicable in uh, a lot of what the UN does and would work on. So that's, uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, it's, the, you know, connecting the talk to the work. Thank you so Thank much, Lisa. Thank you so much for that. Right? Yeah. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it, it sounds like it was a lot of awareness and, and it, it, it will take it to the next level. And for being sophomores, maybe for them to continue on the path and do the education to get to the point where they are maybe taking something and then uh, moving it forward. So it sounds incredible. I would love to hear more about it. Um, so we're connected. You, I know, Rosemary, I think I probably sent you a LinkedIn as well. So <laughs> hopefully we'll stay connected. I want to pass this Absolutely. on to um, Arif for analyzing uh, ESG and aluminum companies. And because we have some time and we went over a little bit, we have the time. I just did the calculation. So please go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank have you. a nice day. Take care. Oh, should we share? Bye. Are you staying on? Um, I need to jump off. Okay, yeah. Go nice. Another uh, thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Take so, care. Bye bye. So, uh, my our research, uh, I did this with uh, two of my colleagues, John Mingiero and uh, Charles Canty. We am from Iona University. We are right across the river. Not actually right across, but in the New York area. So what uh, we did is, this is our ongoing research. We developed a model of measuring ESG because a lot of times we see that more of the ESG part is focused on E, not the S and the G. So what we did, we developed kind of uh, uh, a measurements. We'll, I'll get to the criteria in a little bit. That follows pretty much like what, uh, the UN suggest their goals. So this is the criteria, criteria basically based on their goals. So sustainability, of course, means that leave the planet as you got it. I know this is a definition from global reporting initially, but that's what technically it means. So like just when you know you lend up your friend your car, you tell them. I better get it in the same shape you got it from me. So that's pretty much the idea of sustainability that we lead the planet as we got it. So, uh, uh, aluminum is one of the industry we looked early. We, we looked at uh, pharma, we looked at food industry, we looked at real estate construction. Uh, we also looked at uh, one more, which is to get my mind, uh, chemical. Uh, so aluminum is our uh, next one. I think sixth one we're going to look at. Um, so we are applying the same kind of measurement to them. So uh, aluminum is because it produces some 
uh, gases which are not good for environment, uh, tetra uh, fluor fluoromethane, which is like 6500 the global warming potential, and hexafluoromethane, which has thane, which has like 9200. So these are harmful uh, component uh, byproducts. There are people who also talked about including valuation in uh, sustainability in the company valuations. Like when you evaluate the company, you should also look at the sustainable sustainability contributions. Why we came up with this is another reason because we want to go industry by industry. Because most of the measures measures we have to just put everything in the same same criteria. Like they do not differentiate it. They said. It's all the same. It's not true because different industries industries have different impact on the environment. And of course, if industry is doing a lot for the environment, but the industry has a huge impact on it. So of course, everybody say, oh, this is the this company is doing great, but they actually belong to an industry that destroying the environment more than other industries. I'm not going to name any industries because so anyway, we came up with this aluminum. Uh, we picked the companies because we have a we have to do it manually, and we were three of us. So we picked up these twenty seven top companies around the world on aluminum based on their uh, revenue. The revenue has to be ninety percent from aluminum. That's the first criteria. Second, their uh, market capitalization has to be more than five hundred million. So bigger company. So we twenty seven is the magic number we got. But again, we are doing it manually, so we haven't finished all 27 of them yet. And it's hard to find data on, on all of them. But it has improved since we started. Uh, when we started, it's hard to get the data because you have to go through. But now companies are starting to put forward their sustainability report separate, which is a very useful resource for us. We don't have to go all around the internet, their websites and all that to find what they're doing. So the first paper that uh, we worked on, I didn't mind the whole day, but uh, my colleagues worked on that. So that was published uh, in 2021, but actually this work started in 2020, like 2017 or even earlier. It took a long time for them to get that in. So that same model, in this paper, they applied it on chemical pharma and uh, food. And now we're applying the same model on of them trying to create a good index and we'll see how it goes. So this is our uh, ratings. A is excellent. It has to be a very good environmental friendly project. It, has, it should have, because we're going project by project, again, depends on the industries. So it has to be short-term, short-term effects. So three to five years, that's A in terms of duration. And uh, good B is five to eight year impact, C is eight to 10 years, and D, which is a minor one, oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Like, it's pretty much like that. Like, oh, this is a project, it's ongoing. But, but and this is, this is our criteria based on sustainability categories. These categories, we pretty much took out, keeping in mind, the UN goals. So renewable energy, of course, A, because that's what, then we have recycling material, uh, organic, uh, organic grown products. So now you see this one is more on the food industry than any other. The non-GMO again, because we did food, so it's in there. Uh, zero waste reduction, that's kind of applicable to every company and so on and so forth, reduce obesity and all, everything. I'm not going to talk about all 22 of these, but all 22 does not apply on every industry. Some of them have it, some of them don't. So, but we categorize them, we see, and then we score the companies based on all these factors. And uh, we have to, of course, look at their sustainability report and annual report and anything they got on their website or any publications they did based on that. So these are the 10 companies we were able to analyze. And we found that the score range between 94 to 
51. So, and these are all international companies. Some, uh, like the first one is the change the name to get from China. Uh, number four is Russian company. Uh, and there's also number six, which is actually Bahrain, a Bahrain company, Bahrain company. So they're all over the world. So these are our uh, categories, different categories, scores they got. See, most of them projects are A, B, and C, but again, these are scores. Uh, the pro, uh, like, for example, A, the first company got 15 A project, 10 B project, uh, two C projects. So A makes them four, 60, B, C, 30, uh, two projects is these two each project it makes a total of 94. So that's where the numbers are coming from. Just to show a little bit of relationship, because a lot of people, whenever we used to take that, they say, oh, what about the bigger companies? Do they spend more on it? Not necessarily. You can see the graph is all over the place. So revenue actually has a relation with it. We have 10 observations. I can run a regression. It doesn't not going to do any good, but kind of graph tells the story that it's there's no relationship between sales and revenue, uh, sorry, sales or revenue and their environmental score. So it doesn't mean if you have got more revenue, you are spending more on sustainability. For some reason, the dots disappeared from here. So I don't know why. Anyway, this graph is supposed to tell you about score and activity, and that's pretty much just a straight, uh, like a straight, pretty much straight line. There were dots in there that showed you a straighter line. Uh, the reason the, which is pretty much understandable, you have more activities, you have higher score. Why did we put that graph in there is because to show that it's not that, there, and also to, talk about the companies who show a lot of activities, but have no impact. Like you can have like 60 activities going on, but you have very small impact because they are in a very small impacted zone or area. So again, what we're trying to do is go and promote industry-wise and based on our method. That's the reason we came up on this one is that we wanted people to adopt it the companies and show that where their projects lie. So they can line themselves with the UN goals. And very interestingly, a lot of companies are doing it. Not all of them, but quite a few are doing it, especially the big ones. They are in their sustainability report, they talk about UN goals. So, but we want industry-wise companies, not just putting everything together. And we want, Companies to be more forthcoming and transparent about their projects and products. So next step is to uh, cover all the companies that we have uh, selected, and then next and of course keep applying these models to all the industries. That's our kind of goal, and see if there's any internal and external factor that affects sustainability. We because we are talking about just one, which is revenue. But what we want to do once we score everything and then we get a method to score every year, then we can see how these sustainability efforts are impacted by internal and external factors of the company, industry, and country. Okay, any questions or yeah. concerns? Yes. Do you go back to that sales and score graph? Yeah, Do you yeah. think that maybe, and eventually when you get to the point that you've studied it over the years, will that, I, I would assume that that would change as the score gets more widely marketed, accepted within the industry, that it will have that impact, that it will affect the sales and the revenue, right? It is, yes, it is possible. And the other thing that uh, we also want we're actually trying to get some help from the school to get us, give us some funding so we can mm -hmm. deliver more uh, companies because it can also be country-wise. Yeah. <clears throat> like maybe in 
US with this more awareness, if we get uh, more companies, because in 10 that we analyze some Chinese, some Iranian, some Russian, some American companies, so mixture, but if we can have enough data to compare countries, maybe in one country, it's more on the revenue and others may not be. So it all, yeah, it can be. I mean, it seems like marketing is going to kind of, kind of get out the, the data that you guys are doing or the research that you're doing, the data that you're collecting just needs to be brought to a higher level. Yeah, <laughs> this is actually kind of our objective, Yeah. but we're small school, so it, that's the one thing. What we want people to understand that how to look at sustainability. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, people are mostly just concerned about environment part. Yeah. They don't see the equality part, the human rights part. That a lot of times it's been ignored. Everybody is mostly talked about zero emissions, mm -hmm. waste management, but there are other aspects of it which have to be included. Yeah. So hopefully, I mean, maybe through collaboration. Of other universities. Yeah, I just feel like I feel like it's potential. It's just getting it out there. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, if you ever want to, any help for how to present the market, yeah. I can definitely help. <laughs> I'll offer it to you as well. I'm a, I, I'd like to play around and um, visually. I know my slides, my students have said that they've never seen my slides because I animated them sometimes to keep them engaged. And then the colors um, as well. So I'm, I'm always available. Yeah, I mostly just, you know. Your skills are very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> Would you mind passing my flash? I want to oh, yes. The blue one, yes. Thank you. So now we'll move on to our last presenter. Um, whose presentation I have here as well. Um, Shanaj. Shanaj is going to be presenting here. Yes. Not this one. This one. Then I'll go into presentation mode. Okay, you have um just so that you know you have till about noon with questions and answers and then do you want me to move? I'm gonna take picture, No, I just asked you to take some okay. yeah, you can see it just okay. yeah. Good afternoon. I think it's still morning. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh actually uh, I got a small project uh, which I didn't start to implement and the idea is I'll just share my project idea uh, and it's since it's connected with the sustainability goals so uh, and I, I was planning to come for my research mobility next year so uh, the this time the idea is to make a uh, network with this institution so that I can really implement my this project uh, in this year and next year uh, my project title is conceptualizing age-friendly environments uh, and uh, my informants are elderly immigrants uh, especially asian and african uh, elderly people and for my ps and this is my postdoc funding uh, i have just com uh, com completed my phd in 2019 and uh, in my phd actually uh, I, I my focus was uh, Finnish and Swedish elderly who are living in Arctic part, like northern part of Finland and Sweden. There, uh, I have researched uh, how this Arctic transformation is impacted uh, to the uh, daily life of the elderly people and how and how it uh, it's impacted to their human rights and uh, what are the challenges they have faced. So. Uh, from that idea, uh, and also what are the mm, important compo uh, components elderly people they have shared from their experiences that is important for the uh, age-friendly environment. So I was looking for, uh, I was thinking that uh, I'll do it the same thing from immigrant perspective, that uh, what kind of challenges immigrant elderly people they are really experiencing in, in uh, Finland and uh, my um, informants uh, will be from five different cities. Uh, I just have collected or, or interviewed some elderly from 
Finnish north, like from the Romanian city where I belong to now, uh, and I'm living more than 20 years in Finland. My Finnish is better than my English, and I sometimes forgetting some words, and uh, always Finnish words are coming um, fast. So from fin from the um, experiences of Finnish elderly, I found that uh, care poverty, this out migration, in migration, or this uh, because of climate change, there are some health problems. Uh, uh, elderly people they have mentioned and. Uh, I, uh, my focus was also finding this gender dimension. Uh, is it uh, men and women, they are experiencing the same way or, or not? And uh, uh, from my previous data, it came out that uh, women, are, women are facing, elderly women are facing more challenges because, because of some um, structural inequality, what they have mentioned that they have worked uh, unofficially at, uh, because those elderly who I have interviewed, they were born between 1920 to 19, uh, before 1920 actually, yeah. And they have uh, worked uh, at home uh, and there were some, some elderly people that they said that they have really worked the same way with their hus husband, but in the pension system, women are receiving very uh, less pension and the services are becoming more expensive and women, since women are living longer, it, it doesn't prove that uh, uh, women are living healthy uh, 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 because with that poor uh, pension, they, could, uh, uh, they couldn't buy the um, services uh, are available. And, and uh, from the um, COVID time, the prices, uh, those are really uh, coming rise and and now for this um, war um, because we are the neighbor country and all products and all services they are becoming really uh, higher and expensive uh, and um, quite many young women actually moving from north to south and uh, this really giving threats to the elderly cares and uh, there are uh, less than one person men are involved with this care sector. So elderly people are feeling very insecure. Uh, so in my new project, I, what I said that I wanted to see from the experiences of elderly people that uh, immigrant elderly people that uh, is it the what Finnish elderly people they they have identified what are the similar similarities and differences uh, uh, from the point of this uh, uh, age friendly environment concept because uh, uh, United Nations uh, actually World Health Organization they have identified these eight components that that, that will be part of uh, age friendly environment and they have uh, implemented this uh, within 30 European countries and uh, from my perspective I was just thinking that these uh, are applicable for especially the uh, native people, it will not work. Uh, this is my hypothesis that it will not be work 100% for the elderly people because of their different cultural background and this language is a big obstacle for them. And uh, I was defining, or I mentioned in my project that to me in this age friendly environment, uh, uh, it could be like uh, defined as an environment that empowers older people to live independently, to stay active for a longer period, and to live safely and securely. And it is a space where they may enjoy proper respect regardless of their age, gender, ethnicity, and country of origin. And from my previous project, uh, uh, like some elderly people, they were complained that uh, when uh, they were living in the nursing homes, then they were not um, getting those traditional foods, so what uh, they used to eat, and uh, the nurses who are providing services, they uh, they cannot uh, speak um, Sami, so uh, that was the, their expectation uh, that uh, they were looking for uh, better services and uh, those cultural issues. Uh, what uh, they used to do is so that they, those kind of um, wishes they can find it from the nursing home. So those points I was just thinking uh, what uh, uh, new things or what if it is some same kind of similar uh, expectations or challenges. Uh, 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 obviously, immigrant people, they will uh, face more challenges because of this language. Uh, those who are coming um, 
like uh, my focus is two group of uh, immigrants, those who really migrated long time ago and they have studied and worked there and uh, now they are uh, retired. Uh, that is one group. And if I wanted to see the differences also this uh, that who, those who moved earlier and those who moved later on, like because of maybe uh, their country's problem or for that to support uh, ch their children are living uh, that two group of, obviously this there will be differences because uh, those who came early this already adopted to that culture but those who uh, came later so what are the differences uh, so the, uh, that was also one idea that uh, um, if I uh, first I thought that I would just focus only those later immigrant people but then I found it from uh, the Finnish north, it's difficult to find elderly, immigrant elderly there because people all are moving really or live, try to live in the city, uh, urban areas so like uh, they are moving to Helsinki or something. So it was difficult for me to uh, find uh, elderly who moved to after 55 or uh, after 40 something. So that's why I have tried to interview two group of people and um, my research questions for this project uh, which I mentioned in the uh, that I wanted to uh, say that uh, how or based on the experiences uh, I wanted to reconceptualize this uh, definition of age friendly environment if needed, and then uh, I wanted to see how this uh, age, gender, and this so socioeconomic position uh, and ethnicity, uh, these differences how it, it will co uh, connect it to. Uh, each other, and um, I wanted to also compare with the existing policy documents like uh, this uh, um, social, uh, the health and social services act for all. So, uh, does it this act is creating some kind of injustice or discrimination because uh, uh, the capability of the People, it's not the same. So if they are treating all people the same way, so if they need to modify the policy or so, something, especially I found that there is an integration uh, policy for the elderly, for the uh, immigrant people. Uh, so uh, somehow from the experiences, I wanted to compare that. Do they need to really? Um, add something in these integration policies or modify something uh, in the health service uh, act because, uh, because during this um, COVID, COVID time, uh, quite many services were, were digitalized and um, many elderly people, even those Finnish people, they had difficulties uh, to get the services because they were not used to those uh, digital uh, service. They were not familiar that much with that. And this is uh, my um, theoretical uh, analytical tool that I will, how I will connect to and I'll uh, collect the all data. As I said, that I, I am just in the beginning of my project uh, when I collect the, my uh, informants ex experience and then I will connect that how it is uh, connected with this capability of, uh, approach. And, uh, my focus is uh, to make uh, or reconceptualize this age friendly uh, environment so that there is, uh, all kind of people they can accommodate uh, with this uh, um, structure. And that was my just, just project plan and activities, uh, like what I should do within three years. And I need to just publish. <laughs> uh, I, I was just, what I said that I, I'm. I wanted to share my plan, but the main basic thing is to promote the inclusiveness and to reduce the poverty because it's already established from from the experiences of Finnish or Nordic experiences. This this care, care the lack of caregivers and elderly people's care is really in risk, and uh, they are already working for that. And, and immigrant elderly, uh, what kind of uh, exp feelings they are feeling because uh, I have interviewed or visited some uh, elderly home in Finland uh, until we don't have that many Im uh, immigrant elderly people so but they are getting old or they're uh, they, 
uh, they are still receiving services or living with the joint. In, uh, they are not living in a joint family, but still they are family members uh, in some culture. Uh, they are helping to, to get some services, but uh, because of this, um, now children are moving in different countries. So, uh, uh, what kind of services or care issues they are th thinking because of diff uh, cultural differences or these religious differences? So th that was the idea that I'll um, collect and then see you from this theoretical uh, uh, perspective. That uh, how I I will analyze and. I'll start to do immediately when I go back because now I'm doing all my literature reviews and uh, also planning to interview and collect data from different five different cities. So I have just completed to in, from one city. That's all. So if you have any questions, so that's welcome. Thank you. And sorry that I don't know if you are, if you understand my English because you all are based on US and. I know this is not Thanks. I have a question. What can you do? There is both this physical and mental capability. And uh, of course, this, uh, uh, this capability means I, I, need, uh, I need to go through, like, if someone has uh, physical uh, limitation, and again, if they have also uh, psychological problem and then economic, especially for uh, immigrant people, this uh, socioeconomic position is the main thing. And that will be my main focus that if somebody has a uh, really good background, uh, and then of course uh, they will have, get a good pension and something. And then the education is also one factor like who have a good education, they can really adapt uh, in, uh, is, easily then. This is all my hypothesis. Um, I don't know what kind of uh, information I will get. It. Uh, I I have um, hypothesis that those who have a good uh, socioeconomic position in their um, origin country and uh, though they move to maybe to support uh, their children, uh, they will have less challenges and maybe their uh, uh, needs and expectation will be different than who at the less education. But um, you ask that what kind of, so there will be economic uh, cap capability, this physical, mental, all will be included. And based on my in informants data, I will then separate it there and make the group that what kind of capability actually. I will follow mainly this, um, uh, though the capability theory is, uh, um, amortization is the pioneer for that, but uh, there is this feminist, um, researcher now sorry i have forgotten <laughs> because of my <laughs> nervousness the name that uh, uh, there are 12 points i think to um, identify or accommodate those um, categories of the capabilities so I'll, I'll just add um while you're here and i don't know if it's in finland in addition to um, assisted living or nursing homes, we have the daycares that you and I have already spoken about, so adult daycare centers. We have 55 plus community, mm -hmm. um, which has been, regardless of gender, age, ethnicity, or anything, um, they're fully independent. They have these, and a lot of them um, here in New Jersey, definitely I, I'm probably across the nation. And then the adult daycares are specific to um, Specifically, if you're looking at Asian immigrants, um, African immigrants, they are spec they are focused. So the food that they're familiar with will be provided. Um, and even assisted living uh, situations have also included cultural ethnic dishes so that they're more comfortable and stuff. So those were my couple of my points. Um, oh, one other thing was I have a nonprofit and we have student scholars. One of them did a research during COVID on 55 plus individuals and how they were able to access healthcare, their doctors, um, any anything that they needed during COVID because it, it created a lot of situations um, and more challenging for seniors who weren't familiar with online technology or how to kind of do a Zoom call. So um, all of his data was collected and presented to Governor Murphy who then did policy changes 
four users. So it was incredible. And I saw the impact flow through and it was, it was really nice. So, I mean, I have a contact if you need, whatever you need. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, it would be really good if you get provide her yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, uh, during COVID time, I have uh, interviewed 22 Finnish uh, mm. elderly men and women who are over 65 years old. Uh, from my experience, uh, regarding to get access to the health services or other services, I found that uh, usually women, uh, uh, they didn't really, uh, like uh, for some cases, men were um, complaining more about that long loneliness uh, mm -hmm. because they hadn't, couldn't meet with the people, but women were more active. During, they were, they didn't feel this loneliness, but they have problem to use, more problem to use these uh, ICT services compared to the elderly men. Uh, because men, maybe those who retired, they were more involved with their previous work. Uh, they have used more computer, computer and uh, other ICT related things. So that was one interest uh, things that the uh, gender dimension uh, I from my uh, COVID, COVID time came that uh, women didn't come face less challenges concerning the, they were taking care of the garden, house, and grandchildren. And, uh, and they didn't complain. Uh, in one point, those Finnish elders, they were saying that COVID was positive for them because the, they had less tourists who are not really destroying the environment because tourists there uh, in Lapland is, you know, that you know, this is tourist place, especially from November to uh, March, uh, there are quite many uh, tourists coming for skiing and uh, we have this Santa Claus there and uh, especially some of the elderly women they have mentioned that it is good for that outsider is not allowed to come. But on the other hand, um, elderly men, uh, those who were involved with some kind of outside activities, uh, they were really uh, upset and uh, complaining that it was difficult for them, but I was thinking I will also ask those kind of things to the immigrant people that what was their experience. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would love to say if I could do seeing this. So feel free to feel free to reach out to me if I can do any of this at any point in time. Um, and thank you for your presentation.